My wife and I tied the knot later in life. I was 28 and she was 31. That was six years ago. Having lived life to the fullest before meeting, we found ourselves in a financially tight spot. Before getting married, we discussed our mutual desire to have children and for Janet to be a stay-at-home mom until our youngest started school. We both agreed that having a full-time parent was crucial for a child's well-being, provided it was financially feasible. This meant we had some time to build up a nest egg before starting a family. To achieve this, Janet worked full-time while I took on as much overtime as possible. I got into the rhythm of doing double shifts on Fridays, starting late on Saturdays and working another 12 hours. Our efforts were paying off. We now owned our home outright, and our bank balance was steadily increasing. Recent conversations hinted that children were on the horizon, likely before Janet turned 40 and the chances of conceiving a first child diminished. That's why the conversation we had this Thursday night felt so surreal. Kurt, I want to discuss a trial separation, she said. I felt like my brain froze. What? I blurted out, incredulous. If you've ever been on the receiving end of a breakup, you know the feeling. The person initiating it seems to have it all figured out, while you're left bewildered and unprepared. That was me in that moment. Why? I managed to ask, still trying to process what was happening. I just think we need some time apart to rediscover ourselves and appreciate each other again, she explained. Let's face it, Kurt, you're not as romantic as you used to be, and you seem to take me for granted. You always claim to be too tired to go out, our intimacy has declined, and frankly, you've gained some weight. Don't you think a break could benefit us? I was left speechless, grappling with her words and the suddenness of it all. Had I been more composed, I might have picked up on the subtle shift from us to me in her monologue. But in my current state, it completely eluded me. How about we give it a month, Kurt, she suggested. Then we can reassess. I'll be staying at Wendy's. Feel free to call me whenever you like, but let's limit our in-person meetings to once a week. Anything more, and it won't feel like much of a separation, will it? Just know, Kurt, that I love you deeply and believe we'll have beautiful children together. I'm confident that after a month, maybe two at most, we'll be back to where we were. With that, Janet rose, fetched two suitcases from the back hall, and headed toward the front door. Don't I get a say in this, Janet? I stammered. My decision is made, Kurt, she replied firmly. Please sit down, Janet, I implored. Reluctantly, she returned to her seat. Who is he, Janet? I couldn't help but ask. Oh, Kurt, I knew you'd jump to that conclusion, she sighed. I love you, Kurt, and only you. There's no one else, so there's no need to bug my phones, follow me, plant a GPS tracker in my car, or hire a private investigator. In fact, if you were to do any of those things, I might interpret it as a lack of trust in me, and we have to reconsider our relationship. As she moved to rise once more, I instinctively grasped her arm and pulled her back down. This isn't fair, Janet. You've had days, maybe weeks, to plan out your little speech and this impromptu move, but it's all new to me, I expressed, frustration tinging my voice. What move, Kurt? She queried, her expression finally mirroring some of the confusion I was feeling. Can't you see that what you've done puts our relationship in jeopardy, Janet? This unilateral decision of yours smacks of contempt. I've always treated you as my equal partner, and I'd never make such a risky move without consulting you first. What risk, Kurt? I love you, and you love me. Where's the harm in taking a short break? If I miss you before the month is up, I'll come back in a heartbeat. And what do you mean by contempt? She responded, her tone tinged with a mix of curiosity and concern. What I mean is, you haven't given me the chance to explain myself, I countered. For instance, we hardly go out together because I've been working overtime on Fridays and Saturdays. We agreed to the extra hours to improve our finances. Our intimacy has waned, partly because of the natural progression of our six-year marriage and partly because I'm always exhausted. And as for my weight gain, it's because you suggested I take on the supervisor role for the extra income, which isn't as physically demanding as being on the tools. These are just my initial thoughts in the last two minutes. Can't you stay so we can talk this through properly? I'm sorry, 
Kurt. I promised Wendy I'd go out with her tonight, she replied softly, her resolve unwavering. With that, she rose, gathered her bags, and headed toward the door. All I could manage to utter was, just remember, Janet, you're still married. There was only a brief pause before she continued out the door without looking back. That night, sleep eluded me, leaving me unfit for the grueling 16-hour shift the next day. Despite my exhaustion, changing plans was out of the question. The afternoon shift supervisor had already made arrangements, relying on my promise to cover for him again. In my line of work, letting your guard down was not an option. Thus, I found myself in the wrong place at the wrong time on Friday night when a 35-ton loader nearly collided with me. I managed to throw myself out of harm's way at the last second, feeling the heat of the exhaust as I hit the ground. Adrenaline carried me through the remainder of the shift, exacerbated by hunger since Thursday, Janet's usual shopping day, had been skipped due to her packing. The next day, I was back on the job by 10 a.m., subsisting on sandwiches made from week-old bread. The following evening, I stopped at a 24-hour corner store for supplies. Upon arriving home after 11.30 p.m., I noticed the message light blinking on the phone. It was Janet, expressing how she missed me and thanking me for giving her space by not calling. She mentioned she'd be out late again that night and insisted I not call, leaving me feeling increasingly resentful. Here I was working tirelessly to contribute three times as much to our savings, while she seemed to be enjoying a carefree lifestyle. It was a new and bitter feeling, one I had never experienced before. Neither of us reached out to the other on Sunday. By Monday, I made the decision to inform my boss that I wouldn't be available for overtime for the foreseeable future. When he inquired further, I disclosed the near-miss incident from Friday night. He was visibly taken aback and readily concurred with my decision. By Wednesday, with no contact from Janet, she finally called me. It seemed like she didn't have much to say. Feeling a pang of guilt for giving her the cold shoulder, I decided to make amends. On Thursday evening after dinner, I made my way to Wendy's house. As a peace offering, I brought along a bouquet of flowers and a box of chocolates. Wendy, Janet's best friend who had been divorced for over a year, greeted me. Though I never knew the exact reason for her divorce, I suspected infidelity played a part. She informed me that Janet was in the shower and invited me to wait on the couch. As I sat, Wendy moved closer to me than I was comfortable with. I subtly shifted away, but she persisted. Thankfully, Janet emerged from the shower at that moment. I presented her with the flowers and chocolates, but our conversation felt strained, lacking the usual ease we shared. After some awkward small talk, Janet asked, Was there something you wanted, Kurt? I was somewhat taken aback by her question. No, I just dropped by to ask my wife out on a date tomorrow night, I replied. I'm sorry, Wendy, and I already have plans, Janet responded. Wait, tomorrow is Friday. You work Friday nights. Not anymore, Janet. I quit, I admitted. But what about the money, she inquired, clearly concerned. I've made a decision to prioritize my marriage and physical well-being. I began meeting Janet's gaze squarely. With the added responsibilities of shopping, cleaning, and cooking on top of my full-time job, I found myself more exhausted than ever. When I received your message last Saturday night at 11.30, informing me of your plans to go out, I realized I was pushing myself too hard. Last Friday, I was so fatigued that I narrowly escaped a serious accident at work. Janet's expression shifted to one of shock, and she moved closer, enveloping me in a hug. Please be careful, darling, she urged softly. I'll need your little sperms in a few months' time. Her sentiment was interrupted as Wendy re-entered the room, bringing a sudden end to the moment. Apologies for rushing you out, Kurt, but the girls will be arriving soon for a Tupperware party, Wendy announced, breaking the tension. I made a swift exit. There are some scenes a man was never meant to witness. Janet escorted me to the door, and in a moment of desperation, I pleaded, Please come home, Janet. I miss you. Give it another three weeks, Kurt, then we'll discuss it, she responded, her discomfort evident in her demeanor. Any hope that surged within me dissipated as she added, Why don't you take a break from overtime for a month to regain your strength? We'll need the extra money, Kurt. 
I glanced at the flowers and chocolates still lying where she had casually tossed them and left without another word. Over the next week, she called me twice, expressing disappointment that I hadn't reached out to her. I tried to explain that between working full-time, cooking for myself, and hitting the gym, I had little time to spare. But it seemed to go over her head. The following week, my usual visit fell on Tuesday night. Once again, Janet was in the shower when I arrived. This time, I avoided the couch, remembering the discomfort from the last encounter. Wendy, dressed to the nines, stood unusually close as she spoke, making me feel uneasy. When Janet finally descended the stairs, also dressed up, she appeared slightly uneasy as she explained that I should have called ahead. Had I done so, I would have known they had plans to go out. Feeling humiliated, I was swiftly ushered out, and as the door closed behind me, I could have sworn I heard giggles from the other side. I vowed that would be the last time I subjected myself to such humiliation. Neither of us reached out for the remainder of the week. The following Sunday, I was working out in the backyard, using homemade weight equipment I had cobbled together. I could already feel my strength returning. Suddenly, I felt arms wrap around me from behind, and a body pressed against my sweaty back. It was my first human contact in over two weeks, and I welcomed it until Wendy's voice startled me from beside my ear. Sorry, handsome, I couldn't resist, she murmured. Shocked, I quickly disengaged and turned around. Trying to mask my discomfort, I offered her coffee. I couldn't help but notice her attire, which, while usual for her, showcased her impressive cleavage. Inside, I made sure to sit at the far end of the kitchen table, hoping to maintain some distance. But Wendy pulled up a chair right beside mine so close that our legs were touching. We engaged in awkward small talk, a skill I never excelled at. Are you going to ask how Janet is doing? Wendy inquired. No, I replied firmly. She made it clear it's none of my business. Wendy's smile widened. She's a bit upset, you know. She was hoping you'd be begging and groveling by now. Sorry, Wendy, that's not my style, I retorted. I asked her out on a date the first time I came here, and she turned me down, claiming she already had plans. She never bothered to reschedule. I have no idea what this separation is about, so I'm just going to wait and see if she comes back or if our marriage is over. I knew every word I said would be relayed to Janet. I expected Wendy to look concerned at my last statement, but instead, she just smiled and placed her hand on my leg. It felt like some sort of test, one I was determined to pass, as I felt no emotional attraction towards Wendy. Her physical appearance, however, was another matter. I couldn't help but notice that another button of her top had mysteriously undone itself. You know, I've always admired you and Janet as a couple, Wendy continued, her tone probing. You must be really secure in your love to let her date other guys, or are you just pretending you're not worried? My blood ran cold. We hadn't discussed dating during this unilateral separation, but my reminder, don't forget you're married, should have made my stance clear. Without a word, I abruptly left the house and headed straight to Wendy's backyard. Through the kitchen window, I spotted Janet in a bikini, sunbathing on the deck. With determination, I marched outside. What's this about you dating Janet? I confronted her, trying to keep my tone steady. I haven't been dating, Kurt, she responded calmly. We met a couple of guys last Tuesday at a club, danced a bit, and mentioned we might be there again last night. We bumped into them again, but that hardly constitutes a date. I expected Janet to appear concerned as she defended herself, but instead, she seemed determined. And what happened last night, then? I pressed. Nothing, just more dancing, she replied. Nothing inappropriate. We haven't kissed or anything like that. They bought us some drinks, and we danced a bit. Nothing inappropriate. Since when has it been appropriate for a married woman to dance with other men when her husband isn't even there? And I suppose at the end of the evening, you just happened to mention when you'd be there next. I challenged, met with silence. If you meet them again, it will definitely be a date, and just as definitely be very inappropriate, I continued. Janet, all this is really hurting me, you know. I still have no idea what this separation is about. Can we skip the next two weeks and just have you come home right now? I really miss you. No, Kurt, not yet, she replied firmly. In fact, I think we'll go past the month. 
I haven't regained my old feelings for you yet. Once again, she seemed oddly uncomfortable, as if she were saying something she didn't truly want to. Of all her recent irrational behavior, this was the most confusing. I stared at her for a moment longer before getting up to leave. You could ask me out on another date, you know, she remarked casually. You might get lucky this time. Without pausing or looking back, I retorted, or you could ask me out. You know where I live. Starting from Monday, Janet began calling the home phone every night. Our conversations were always brief and uncomfortable. I couldn't shake the feeling that she was just checking to make sure I was at home. The implications of that didn't sit well with me. On Friday night, the home phone diversion to my mobile, which I had set up, worked perfectly. As I answered, I could hear music playing in the background. I was already on my way to Wendy's house, and I confirmed that Janet's car was missing from the driveway. I decided to drive by the nightclub strip, about 10 minutes away from Wendy's, where I eventually spotted Janet's car parked in the corner of one of the bar's parking lots. Peering through the window of the bar, I spotted Janet and Wendy sitting alone in a booth. As I observed, two more girls joined them. One of them looked familiar, another friend of Janet's named Barbara, while the other was a stranger. I watched as Barbara introduced the newcomer to Janet and Wendy. Seizing the opportunity while they were distracted, I sneaked into the back corner of the bar and concealed myself at the far end. Ten minutes later, luck was on my side. The booth adjacent to the girls emptied out, and I quickly took the opportunity to sit down, making sure they weren't looking my way. By hunching slightly and positioning myself with my back to them, I remained completely hidden. With some effort, I managed to catch most of what was being said, with Barbara leading the conversation. You're crazy, Janet. Based on what you've said, your Kurt seems much more romantic than my husband, remarked another voice, likely belonging to the stranger. Yeah, I agree. I would have been grateful for even half of what you described getting from my ex, chimed in the stranger. Wendy interjected, don't you think Janet deserves better? I mean, just look at her, she's beautiful. Barbara added her opinion, I don't know, guys, this sounds like a dangerous game to me. How do you treat him, Janet? Do you spoil him rotten? With all that overtime he works, he must be exhausted most of the time. Do you keep him in bed all Sunday, satisfying his every desire? If you were mine, I sure would. Janet, with her soft voice, replied, but I couldn't make out her words as the conversation carried on for several minutes. All I caught when Janet finished and Barbara resumed was, is that all? And you're making this guy fight for you. At that moment, someone started the jukebox, providing me with the perfect opportunity to slip away to the restroom. When I returned, my booth had been taken, so I found refuge in my corner of the bar. As the bar filled up, I wondered how long it would be until the guys showed up. Over the next hour, I observed numerous men approaching the girls, attempting to strike up conversations, but all left disappointed. Then I noticed the stranger making her way to the bar. As she neared my corner, I made a show of making room for her. She smiled in response and ordered four drinks. Close up, she was quite attractive with short, curly brown hair and a friendly demeanor. As she waited for her drinks, she turned to. So, do you come here often? Alice asked with a playful grin. Hey, that's my line, I teased. Well, you were too slow, she retorted. We engaged in easy conversation until her drinks arrived. I couldn't help but notice her searching glance at my wedding ring finger. Due to the nature of my job, I hardly ever wear my ring. When her drinks finally arrived, she surprised me with her request. Look, the conversation at my table is dreadful. Do you mind if I use you as an excuse to escape? She asked. What? Do I mind if a beautiful girl talks to me? What do you think? I should warn you though, I am married, but my marriage is in extreme difficulty. That's why I'm here, I admitted. Wow. Well, thank you for your honesty. I'm just looking for companionship, so if it's still okay, I would still like to chat, she replied, flashing a smile at my mischievous grin. Alice returned a couple of minutes later, and we continued chatting easily for the next hour and a half. I kept glancing over to ensure we weren't being observed. I noticed a man had taken the vacant seat at the girls' table and was buying all the drinks. Alice was delightful company, 
and we felt very comfortable together. At 11.30, Barbara approached us. I hadn't noticed her until it was too late to hide. She wore a vaguely puzzled expression on her face, and I knew the feeling. She recognized me, but couldn't remember where from. I smiled as Alice introduced us, and Barbara leaned in to whisper in Alice's ear, You're right, he is cute. Janet has offered us a lift home. Do you want a ride? I offered, noticing the indecision on Alice's face. I've really got to get going anyway. Lovely to talk to you, Alice, I said, kissing her on the cheek. She blushed and left. As she reached the door, she turned back and handed me a business card with a smile before departing. I watched all three girls leave, leaving Wendy and the man at the table. Giving them a five-minute head start, I decided to make my way out to the car park. Two minutes later, my phone rang. The caller ID showed it was Janet ringing through the diverted home phone. After exchanging greetings, she asked why there was music in the background. Are you having a party at the house? She inquired. I'm at a bar, Jules. I've spent the evening chatting to a beautiful girl, I replied. What the hell, Kurt? Who said you could do that? She exclaimed. Aren't you implying that you're the only one free to date? Aren't you suggesting I'm not allowed to? I shot back. Well, you aren't. While you're married to me, I expect you to behave appropriately, she retorted. So, you're saying you didn't call me from a bar earlier, I challenged. Well, yes, she admitted. And I suppose those guys from last time didn't show up, did they? I pressed. No, yes, maybe. Look, Kurt, I told you I'm not dating, she replied, her tone uncertain. It was somewhat reassuring to know that I wasn't the only one confused. Look, Janet, can we please cut this crap and go back to how it was before? Come home now, I'll meet you there, I pleaded. There was a pause before she responded, No, I'm sorry, Kurt. I'm just not ready. Okay, just come for the night, then, I suggested. No. Sorry, Kurt. I'll call you later, she said before hanging up. An hour later, I was on the brink of sleep when I heard the garage door opening. I bolted out of bed, my heart racing with the hope that Janet had changed her mind. Peering out the window, I saw Janet's car parked across the street. As the garage door closed, I realized she had just come to check if I was home before driving off again. Disheartened, I returned to bed, my mind swirling with the confusion of the evening's revelations. With no clear understanding of what everything meant, I couldn't shake the feeling that things were spiraling out of control. The following Saturday afternoon, Wendy paid another visit. I confronted her about Janet's behavior, but she denied any knowledge, albeit unconvincingly. When she attempted to get close to me, I anticipated her move and kept her at arm's length. What are you doing, Wendy? I'm married to your best friend, for God's sake, I scolded. For now, Kurt. I just wanted to see if I'd have a shot with you after Janet leaves you, she confessed, her words sounding contrived and absurd. Nonetheless, it confirmed one of my suspicions. Don't you mean if Janet leaves me, Wendy? I corrected her. Of course, Kurt. I really hope things work out for you, she replied vaguely. Expressing my discomfort with the situation, I escorted her out, though she seemed reluctant to leave, even going as far as preparing a picnic for us. In the end, I had to be blunt about how inappropriate her behavior was before she finally got the hint. Are you and Janet going out again tonight? She asked before parting. Yes, probably, I replied. Feeling frustrated, I decided to call Alice. She sounded pleased to hear from me, but explained it was impossible for her to get away that night. Instead, she suggested meeting on Tuesday. Feeling obligated, I reminded her of my marital situation before agreeing. Look, it will be strictly as friends, Alice. I'm still in the midst of a very messy personal situation at the moment. I just really enjoyed your company last night. I promise to treat you with the utmost respect until everything is sorted out, I assured her. After expressing that she had also enjoyed our chat and acknowledging her own complicated situation, she ended the call, expressing her anticipation for Tuesday. Monday morning marked the beginning of a new routine with Janet. She started calling me at 6 a.m. every workday, around 6 p.m., when I typically arrived home from work, and again just before bedtime. 
While she claimed it was because she missed me, she continued to reject my pleas for her to return. It was becoming evident that I was being checked up on. On Wednesday, I noticed a message on the home phone answering machine. Although it was only from a marketing company, its presence was significant as it hadn't been diverted to my mobile. Upon checking the home phone, I discovered that the diversion had been removed. Someone had visited, it seemed. On Tuesday, Alice greeted me at the front door of her apartment, and we departed promptly. She looked stunning. Once seated at the restaurant, I initiated the conversation. So, would you like to share why your personal life is a bit complicated? I inquired. Yes, her name is Diana, she responded. As it turned out, Diana was Alice's three-year-old daughter. The father had abandoned them after deciding that family life was too serious. Tonight, Alice's mother was looking after Diana. Eager to shift the focus away from discussing my own personal troubles, I steered the conversation in a different direction. The other night when we talked at the bar, you mentioned the conversation at your table was pretty awful. What was all that about? I asked. Oh, that? Just awful conversation and stupid people, Alice replied. There was this woman named Janet. She's currently separated from her husband, but she's planning to go back to him. Apparently, she hopes the separation will make him fight for her, be more romantic, and all that. But the ridiculous thing is, from what she described, he already seems pretty good. He brings her flowers every week, takes her on monthly date nights, spoils her endlessly. Despite working late on Saturdays, he gets up early on Sundays to make her breakfast. He even surprised her with a cruise last year. Honestly, I'd be happy with just half of that for my ex. It made my friend Barbara sad too. She doesn't get treated like that. Some people just don't appreciate what they have, I guess, I remarked. It gets even more ridiculous. Even before they separated, she was trying to make him jealous, Alice continued. How so? I inquired. Well, apparently she would come home later and later from girls' nights out, intentionally wearing men's cologne, and once she even got a pair of panties from her friend Wendy. They were all well used if you catch my drift. She left them on the bedroom floor hoping he'd notice, but the guy didn't bat an eye, Alice explained. Her husband sounds pretty naive to me, I remarked. Or perhaps he just loved her so deeply that he overlooked those things, Alice mused. But when all her attempts failed, she and her friend devised this trial separation scheme. The plan was for him to become desperate and fight for her. But instead, he's not reacting at all. Could for him. When he didn't respond as expected, they decided to take it up a notch. She stopped contacting him, and he ignored her. Then her friend planted the idea in his head that she was out dating. Despite all their efforts, the poor guy isn't playing along. Honestly, I have to admire him. It's exactly what I would do if someone treated me that way. What's really heartbreaking is when Barbara questioned how much effort Janet put into the marriage. I think that's when Janet realized just how one-sided their relationship was. You'd think that would motivate her to end all the nonsense, but it hasn't. Now they've backed themselves into a corner and don't know how to get out. All because this proud man isn't following their script, I added. Well, she could just go back to him, lay it all out, and try to return to normal, I suggested. Yeah, that's what I would do, and I think that's what she truly wants. Except I have a feeling her friend is keeping her on track. Wendy gave her some strange looks last Friday. They seemed almost hungry, Alice remarked, her expression turning thoughtful. Could it be that the friend is trying to drive a wedge between them to steal the husband for herself? I pondered. You know, you may be onto something there. It would certainly align with what I observed. But that would make her one cold, evil person, Alice remarked. If you were the husband, what would you do? I asked. Well, I don't know much about their relationship until now, but my instinct would be to break things off with the foolish, shallow person. Then move on to someone who truly appreciates him, Alice replied. Our conversation shifted to lighter topics when our meals arrived. Despite the pleasant atmosphere, I couldn't shake off the guilt gnawing at me. As the waitress cleared our plates, I felt compelled to address it. You know, Alice, everything you've said has convinced me that you're a genuinely good person with strong values, I began. Thank you, she responded with a smile. Do you think I'm a decent person? 
I asked, bracing myself for her answer. Without hesitation, Alice replied, yes, I consider myself a good judge of character, and I have no doubt that you're a very kind person. I took a deep breath, realizing what I needed to do. With a mix of nerves and determination, I reached across the table, grasping her hands. I need to tell you something, I said, stealing myself for the difficult conversation ahead. Please forgive me, Alice, but I've been less than truthful with you. I've been grappling with confusion lately, and I've done things I'm not proud of in an attempt to find some clarity. But I have immense respect for you, which is why I feel compelled to come clean and tell you the whole truth. My name is Kurt, and I've been married to a woman named Janet for six years. About four weeks ago, she insisted on a trial separation, despite my objections. Tonight, a new friend suggested I should just move on from her. Given the disrespect and pain she's caused, I was leaning towards that conclusion myself. You were right. I did treat her like a queen, but looking back, I realize how little she reciprocated. A range of emotions played across Alice's face, eventually settling on horror. She covered her mouth with a clenched fist. Oh my god, did I just call your wife a stupid bitch? Actually, I was quite offended that you referred to the woman I married in such a derogatory manner, I replied. Her expression softened slightly, but I could still see the conflict in her eyes. I hastened to add, trying to lighten the mood. Do you realize that your first concern was whether you had offended me? That speaks volumes about your character. Of course, I forgive you. Yes, you did use me a bit, but I understand your perspective. Is that why you approached me on Friday night? Were you trying to gather information? You're right, you caught me off guard with that question. But can I rely on your friendship until this situation is resolved, one way or another? Absolutely, Kurt. But I want to make it clear that I don't want any part in sabotaging your marriage. Thank you. Your friendship is all I need right now. From my perspective, I thought our marriage was perfectly happy until one Thursday when Janet dropped the bombshell of a trial separation. Although she initially planned to leave without explanation, I insisted on getting some clarity. But even with her explanation, I'm still deeply confused, because I invested so much time and effort into either work or my relationship with Janet, I never really cultivated any close friendships. Do you think there's any chance of reconciliation? I'm not sure, Alice. Part of me feels like taking her back after the way she's treated me would be letting myself down. And after our conversation, I've realized just how one-sided our marriage was, particularly in terms of romance. To be honest, it's a bit embarrassing to admit. By silent agreement, we shifted to lighter topics for the rest of the evening and ended up having a pleasant time together. Eventually, Alice needed to head home to relieve her mother. I suggested she take her time to process everything and reach out to me when she was ready. I made it clear that I would understand if she chose not to contact me again. The next day, as I was walking towards the grocery store, I heard someone calling out to me from the nearby coffee shop. Turning around, I saw Janet, Wendy, and another girl with her back turned to me. As I approached the table, my heart sank when I recognized Barbara. She couldn't contain her surprise as she exclaimed, You. The implications dawned on me quickly. Janet would soon realize I had been spying on her, and she would know that there were no men involved in her Friday night outing. Depending on what Barbara said, Janet might even deduce that Alice had revealed everything. Surprisingly, I found myself not as worried as I thought I would be. I made a brief, polite excuse to leave, citing the need to head home and cook. I observed Janet's reaction for any signs of guilt, but it seemed to go unnoticed by her. The expected phone call finally came later that night, around 9.30, when I was almost asleep and not exactly in the best state to have a conversation. Kurt, didn't I warn you about spying on me? Your actions demonstrate a lack of trust and respect towards me, Janet reprimanded. From my perspective, Janet, you initiated this separation without giving me any explanation. Wouldn't you expect me to try to understand what's happening? It's still a breach of our agreement, Kurt. Your agreement, Janet. I let my words hang in the air for a moment, hoping she grasped the distinction. But her response took an unexpected turn, veering into philosophical territory. Kurt, 
I'm just struggling to make sense of all this. This trial separation isn't unfolding as I envisioned. I'm uncertain if my love for you matches what's necessary. I propose we extend it by another month or two to see how things develop. She paused, seemingly anticipating my reaction. I chose to remain silent. If her intention was to provoke me into a heated response, she'd be disappointed. This extension seemed like another attempt to push me to try harder. It reminded me of the saying, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Although, I preferred the mining variant. If at first you don't succeed, try more explosives next time. But this extension felt weak and uninspired. Okay, Kurt, I didn't want to resort to this, but I think it's fair. I believe I should be allowed to date other men. Maybe that will help me appreciate your value and reignite my feelings for you. Once more, she paused, seemingly awaiting my outburst. But this time, my silence wasn't a calculated move, I was simply left speechless. When I finally found my voice, I chose to withhold it. I realized that whatever I said in that moment was unlikely to resolve anything. Are you still there, Kurt? She queried. I remained silent, grappling with my thoughts. Part of me wanted to lay out the full extent of my knowledge, but I also recognized that she needed to arrive at her own decision for the right reasons. Revealing everything might lead her back, but it wouldn't address the underlying issues. Kurt, she pressed again. I believe dating would be a grave mistake, Janet. I finally responded, my tone firm. Let me be unequivocal about this. If you choose to date or engage in any behavior that violates the boundaries of marriage, meeting a man repeatedly, dancing with, touching, or kissing another man, I will interpret it as your withdrawal from our marriage. Do I make myself clear? I'm uncertain if our marriage can be salvaged even if you return today, but I'm willing to try. Will you please come back where you belong, Janet? This time, the silence was hers. Well, Kurt, I don't believe you're in a position to dictate terms, she retorted sharply. You don't owe me. I think I'm entitled to seek the romance and companionship I've been missing out on for the past month. At this point, I seriously began to question Janet's state of mind. Did she not realize that the reason she was missing romance was because she had left the one who had been romancing her? So, Janet, you're still intent on opening up this marriage, are you? I pressed, unable to fathom her logic. You never provided me with a reason for this separation that made any sense to me. The closest theory I could come up with was that you were trying to make me work harder to put more effort into our marriage. But I dismissed that as too disrespectful. One benefit of your absence is that it's given me time to reflect. I now realize that I've been the one putting in significantly more effort into our relationship than you have. Yet, here I am, utterly bewildered. Once again, silence hung between us. When she finally spoke, her voice trembled, on the verge of breaking into a sob. It seemed as though she was blindly following a plan that she suddenly recognized was seriously flawed. I'm sorry, Kurt. My mind is made up, she uttered, her words heavy with resignation. The dial tone marked the end of the conversation, and I couldn't shake the feeling that it also signaled the end of our marriage. Bizarrely, when I returned home on Thursday and Friday nights, Janet's car was parked 100 meters down the street in the opposite direction from my approach. I watched her drive away five minutes later, adding another layer of confusion to an already perplexing situation. On Thursday night, Alice called. She graciously forgave me, a weight off my shoulders. She then asked for an update, assuring me that her inquiry was purely out of friendship. I recounted my recent conversations with Janet, along with my analysis of her probable motives. What's your plan now, Kurt? Just going to sit tight and wait for her to deliver the final blow to our marriage, I guess. Do you want me to keep an eye on her this weekend, Kurt? No, don't trouble yourself with this, Alice. How about we figure out where they are and you take me to the same place? No, I won't stoop to her level, but I would like to see you this weekend. We quickly settled on a Sunday afternoon picnic after a bit of negotiation. Alice didn't press me on why I wasn't available on Friday or Saturday, she understood. We must have talked for about two hours. On Friday, it didn't take long to locate Janet and Wendy. The fact that they were at the same old bar led me to consider two possibilities. 
Either Janet was genuinely confident that I wouldn't dare to spy on her, or more likely, she was counting on me to do just that. This time, I watched everything unfold through the windows, feeling a twinge of shame for my actions. That night, Janet was surprisingly well-behaved. It was just her, Wendy, and Barbara, chatting until around 10 p.m. Wendy accepted several dance offers, but Janet and Barbara declined several. Eventually, two persistent guys approached, clearly targeting Janet and Wendy. Barbara left shortly after, leaving the remaining trio at the table. Throughout the night, the two girls covertly surveyed the dark corners of the bar. I was pleasantly surprised when Wendy and Janet left together at 11.30. I followed their taxi back to their place and watched until the lights went out. Saturday was a different story. Once again, it was the same bar and the same two guys were waiting. This time, they wasted no time in making their move. At 8.5 p.m., my marriage came to an end. After Wendy left to dance with her chosen companion, the other guy made his move on Janet. From my vantage point, I could see his hand on her leg. In the five minutes I gave her to handle the situation, she scanned the bar at least six times. I walked into the bar. When Janet saw me approaching, she at least had the decency to push the guy's hand away. Her expression could only be described as smug as she delivered her opening line. Kurt, I warned you not to spy on me again. Sensing my mood, her unfortunate companion stood up, unsure whether to confront me or flee. Ignoring all social norms, I stepped in close, emphasizing his small stature compared to my six-wing frame. In a low growl, I uttered the shortest sentence in the English language. Go. He ran. Keeping my gaze fixed on Janet's face, I sat down in his vacant seat and pulled out a roll of papers from my breast pocket. These are papers for a mutually agreed divorce. I've already filled them out. All you have to do is sign them. I've included a separate agreement on splitting our assets, and I can't see any reason not to split everything 50 50 -ths. It makes sense for me to keep the house since you have already moved out. As I spoke, I observed Janet's smug expression slowly morph into one closer to horror. I didn't linger to witness the rest of her reaction. Avoiding eye contact, I quickly left, hoping to conceal the emotions welling up inside me. Curiosity got the better of me, and I returned to watch through the window. Janet was now openly crying. Within minutes, Wendy returned, looking perplexed. However, as soon as she glanced at the papers on the table, a broad grin spread across her face. Over the next hour, Wendy seemed to do most of the talking. Fifteen minutes into their conversation, Janet's tears subsided, and an hour later, she appeared remarkably relaxed. Wendy's influence was unmistakable. Somehow, she had managed to convince Janet that their scheme was progressing as planned. That night, sleep evaded me once again as I braced myself for the inevitable final confrontation. More anguish lay ahead, and I couldn't shake off my feelings for the woman who had caused me so much pain. Anticipating Wendy's visit the following day, I pretended not to be home when she arrived. Ignoring her persistent phone calls, I waited in silence, expecting the impending confrontation. Surprisingly, there were no calls from Janet. At 1.30 p.m., I found myself knocking on Alice's door, holding a bunch of red roses. As soon as she laid eyes on the flowers, she enveloped me in a warm hug, offering a sense of comfort amidst the turmoil. I was going to ask you how the last few days went, but I can see, Alice remarked perceptively as she noticed the roses in my hand. It was clear she understood the significance of the gesture, recognizing that friends typically didn't exchange roses, especially not in the midst of unresolved issues. Inviting me inside, she led me to an older woman, her mother. Kurt, this is my mom, Batty. Mom, meet my boyfriend, Kurt. Alice introduced us, her words catching me off guard in the best possible way. I was left momentarily speechless, contemplating how much Alice had shared with her mother about us. Fortunately, Batty addressed the question lingering in the air. So, is it finished? she inquired. All over but the shouting, as my old dad used to say, I replied, providing them with an update on the latest developments. I explained my belief that Janet hadn't fully grasped the seriousness of the situation yet, and that there was still work to be done to prove my resolve. Through my words, they could both sense the depth of my pain 
and Batty offered me a comforting hug. Then, a little angel entered the room. Diana had woken up from her nap, and I was introduced to her as well. She seemed disappointed when Alice mentioned that we were heading out, despite Batty's efforts to reassure her about the fun they would have together. Sensing her disappointment, I whispered to Alice. Can she come with us? Are you sure? She asked, surprised by my suggestion. You're a package deal, and I accept that, I affirmed. That would be great. It tears me up to be away from her all week while I'm at work, so I'd like to spend all weekend with her, Alice explained, her eyes reflecting her gratitude. Diana's face lit up with joy upon hearing that she could join us for the afternoon. We had a wonderful time by the river, enjoying the sunshine and each other's company. Alice teased about feeling a bit left out, but the wide grin on her face told me it was all in good fun. After dropping both ladies home, I was welcomed by Batty, who had prepared dinner. I bid Alice farewell with another gentle kiss on the cheek before heading home. As I arrived, I sensed Janet lurking in her usual spot nearby. Before I could even open the front door, she pulled into the driveway. Stepping out of her car, she handed me the papers I had given her on Saturday, signed and witnessed. Here you go, Kurt. Signed and witnessed. Good night, she stated, catching me off guard. With that, she retreated to her car, leaving me stunned, but her departure was interrupted by a bold proclamation. Now that I've called your little bluff, maybe you can ask me out on a date this week sometime. I'm free on Wednesday, she called out before driving off. In that moment, I realized that Janet operated on an entirely different wavelength. If it was truly all over but the shouting, then it seemed like the shouting was going to be one chaotic mess. The shouting began on Monday evening. Wendy was waiting for me in the driveway as I returned from work. Before I could react, she planted a kiss on my lips. Pushing her away firmly, I exclaimed, Listen, once and for all, I am not the slightest bit interested in you, Wendy. Before Wendy could even react, Janet's car came roaring into the driveway, tires screeching. Wendy attempted to dart away down the driveway, but Janet's vehicle blocked her path. As the car rolled to a stop, Janet flung open the door, knocking Wendy to the ground. Despite Wendy's attempts to rise, she was struck hard on the side of the head by Janet's enraged slap, sending her back to the ground. Wendy wisely chose not to get up this time. In normal circumstances, staying down would have been a wise move, but facing an enraged Janet, who had just realized she'd been deceived, it was a dangerous choice. Janet unleashed her fury on Wendy, kicking her repeatedly. I knew better than to intervene. Janet's wrath was like that of a wild animal. When Janet showed signs of exhaustion but continued to seethe with anger, I risked stepping in to restrain her. At that moment, a police car happened to pass by. Janet and I were both cuffed, and an ambulance was summoned for Wendy's injuries. Janet was interviewed first, her shouts echoing from where I sat in the holding cells. Eventually, they transferred her to the cell across from mine. When it was my turn, I recounted the full story to the police, attempting to convey that Janet's actions were provoked. It felt like the least I could do. I was released with an apology at 11 p.m. On Monday, I went to work as usual, grateful for the sanctuary of being over a mile underground where cell phone signals couldn't reach. On my way home, I updated Alice over the phone. She invited me for dinner again and relayed a request from Diana. Could that nice Kurt read me a bedtime story tonight? Arriving home later than usual, I stopped by Wendy's parents' house to speak with them. I explained what I knew about their daughter's manipulation of my wife. Surprisingly, neither of them seemed shocked. I urged them to influence Wendy not to press charges against Janet for assault, and they promised to do what they could. Janet's car was parked in the garage when I arrived home. Upstairs, I found her suitcases unpacked on the bed and the sound of the shower running. Anticipating her descent, I waited downstairs, dialing Alice to cancel our dinner plans. We speculated on Janet's potential strategies, but in hindsight, we both missed the mark. As Janet confidently strode down the stairs, I felt a surge of unease. She approached me, her usual poise undiminished. What's for dinner, Kurt? I hesitated before responding, prompting her to stand directly in front of me. I've decided to forgive you, Kurt, she declared. 
We've both been a bit foolish, but let's move past it. I've returned. If you haven't made dinner plans yet, let's go out. My tongue felt tied, but I couldn't suppress my incredulity. Can you explain how I've been foolish, Janet, and what exactly am I being forgiven for? Janet's confident facade faltered for the first time. For the pain you caused me with that ridiculous divorce stunt, Kurt, it was a low blow, but I knew you were bluffing all along. What makes you so sure it was a bluff, Janet? Because Wendy said, her voice trailed off and the color drained from her face. She sank onto the coffee table with a thud, realization dawning in her eyes. For several uncomfortable minutes, I watched as a new understanding took root in her mind. Finally, she spoke, her voice barely above a whisper. I gave you up, didn't I? You weren't bluffing with the divorce, were you? I was so sure you were that I just signed it, Janet confessed, her voice filled with regret. I shook my head sadly. For the record, Janet, you didn't give me up. You threw me away. I've always done everything I could for you. What did I get in return? You walked out, leaving me lost and alone. I tried to warn you. Didn't I say it was a gamble? How much clearer could I have been? After all the love and effort I put in, I expected, no, I knew I'd earned at least your respect and loyalty. Did I get those? No, I got kicked in the teeth. Disrespected and left broken and confused. Did you ever consider the imbalance of effort in our marriage, the one-sided result I've seen over the last five weeks? No, you let some manipulative person convince you that you could get more. Janet interjected, well, you can't have Wendy now, I've sorted her out. I was taken aback. Look, this has nothing to do with Wendy. I realized at one point that this was all just a ploy on her part to drive us apart, but I've never considered her anything other than the manipulator she is. So we're all right, aren't we, Kurt? Janet asked, hopeful. This was the moment of truth. No, we're not okay, Janet. We have the divorce papers to prove it. I can't overlook the disrespect you've shown me all along, not to mention the threats. I have to tell you, when you threw me away, someone else picked me up. Janet's face turned even paler. What do you mean, Kurt? I've met someone else, Janet. She started off as just a friend who helped me through this. My only friend, after you walked out on me. I'm sorry, Janet, but you gambled and you lost. With that, I left stepping into a new life with a clear conscience, hoping I could still make it to story time. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.